Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Tracy from the Utah Division of Arts and Museums. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We're just gonna give people a few minutes to log in and get settled. Thank you. Hello, welcome everyone. This is Tracy from the Utah Division of Arts and Museums. We're just going to give people another minute or so to join us. Thank you all for being on time. We really appreciate it. Hello, welcome everyone. This is Tracy Hansford with the Utah Division of Arts and Museums. Thank you so much for joining us today. Just a little reminder that this is a webinar, so you will be able to see us, the panelists and our speaker, um, but we cannot see or hear you. If you have a question, please use the Q&A feature, which can be found in the bottom um, center section of your screen. If you hover your mouse down at the bottom, you should be able to see the pop-up controls. Um, any question you have, either a technical or one for UANM staff can go in there or for Nina and we will answer them at the, um, as we need to or at the end of Nina's speech. Um, we are just going to give one more moment as people get settled and then uh, we'll, we will begin. Hello everyone, this is Victoria Borns, the director of the Utah Division of Arts and Museums, and I want to welcome you to this uh, webinar today. I am so excited to introduce our speaker, uh, unless there's anything else, Tracy, that I need to say before I uh, continue. Nope, go ahead. All right, Vicky. All right. so Nina Aslu Tunjili is both chief Council of Government and Public Affairs at Americans for the Arts and the Executive Director of the Americans for the Arts Action Fund. For 27 years, Nina has served as the Chief Policy Strategist for Americans for the Arts federal, state, and local public affairs work, grassroots advocacy campaigns, policy development, and national coalition building efforts with cultural and civic organizations to advance the arts in America. In 2004, she also became the executive director of the Americans for the Arts Action Fund, a separate 501c4 organization. Nina now mobilizes efforts of more than 365,000 citizens in advancing arts policy issues to legislators and candidates seeking federal public office. She is a graduate of George Washington University and the University of Richmond School of Law. After securing several arts funding provisions in the recently passed CARES Act, 
Nina is now providing daily technical assistance to thousands of artists and arts organizations in successfully tapping billions of dollars in relief aid. From my perspective, Nina is an engaging, smart, professional, passionate advocate for arts and culture. I've had the good fortune of knowing and working with Nina, and I'm so grateful she is joining us today. Nina, welcome. Thank you very, thank you very much, Vicki. Thank you for all of you um, joining today in Utah. I'm coming to you just outside of Washington, D.C. Um, in Northern Virginia. So um, today is a great day to participate in this webinar because we have a lot of breaking news that's come out of the Treasury Department that I'll be able to share news. Um, and this is especially important for those of you who have secured PPP loans. Um, uh, the new forgiveness application has come out, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's first start from the very beginning. Um, so the CARES Act was passed in March and it was groundbreaking, $3.2 trillion of funding um, in addition to approving several loans um, to be able to support organizations and companies and gig workers. It was groundbreaking also because of a few other items. One is that uh, Americans for the Arts and some other organizations very much got involved in the advocacy to get gig artists protected during this epidemic and economic crisis. Uh, we knew that gig workers would not be eligible for any kind of, um, the two main sources of funding that was coming through were all through the Small Business Administration or unemployment offices. Two areas historically unavailable to self-employed entrepreneur, 1099 workers, self-employed people, um, gig workers, what we also call. So we fought very hard and it's a rags to riches story because where you weren't available to apply for either, you got both. So you have a choice of being able to get funding through um, the Small Business Administration because we got gig workers to be um, deemed as a business, a business of one. Um, and we also got gig workers to be considered employees, employees of one of your own business. So that's why you were able to get both pandemic unemployment and um, uh, Small Business Administration loans. So there's a lot available in here. That's why early on I created a matrix table to help people with based on the kind of organization that they represent, what they can tap into for the CARES Act. So I'd like Morgan to share her screen and show you what the CARES Act table looks like. This is available on the artsactionfund.org website front slash CARES Act table. And you can see here that um, the CARES Act table and all of its programs that run along the left-hand side um, column, each different category. And before we move down the screen, I wanna show you what happens across the screen in blue. Um, I've divided up the type of entity that can apply and when it's applicable to that entity to tap that particular federal program. So um, in the second column, you see nonprofit 501c3 organizations. In the third column, you have governmental um, organizations. And because we're an arts organization, we're arts specific. And so we're saying governmental arts humanities organizations. So that could be um, the very same Utah arts um, organization that's hosting this event, but it could also be the Salt Lake City Arts Commission. Um, and then it can also be a commercial arts business, meaning it's not a nonprofit, it's a company. So it could be graphic artists, photography studios, um, Miss Molly's dance studio, things like that. It could be a film company, it could be a television company. Um, and then over on the next column, here's where you have the gig artists. Um, and all your 1099 workers. And then we have the individual taxpayers because all of us as employees of something are also individual taxpayers. So some of these CARES Act funds also helped us out. So the first program, I'm, I think almost everybody now should have received their economic stimulus check that was 
kind of unceremoniously deposited into your checking account that was um, that probably just said federal um, stimulus or something like that. And this is that twelve hundred dollars per um, per taxpayer if you made up to a certain amount of money. And then I provide those kind of guidelines of how much, if you're a married couple, if you are a single taxpayer, if it's based on your 2019, 18 tax returns, and if you can get the extra $500 for your dependents who are under the age of 17. If you have it by any chance um, gotten your payment yet, in the left column, I provide links to the particular government entity, in this case, it's the IRS, where you can find out what the status is of that. But if you haven't gotten it yet, that's definitely an issue because every most, the great majority got it on April 15th. If you were a social security recipient who wasn't filing tax returns, you got yours in mid-May because they needed to connect um, your uh, um, direct deposit information with the social security commission, uh, commission and with the IRS. Let's go down to the next page. This is 15 pages long. I'm going to go through it quickly. Um, so in the second section, we have um, pandemic unemployment compensation. And this is what I alluded to earlier in the top of the hour for this um, webinar and, and how this was a huge benefit for individual gig workers. Um, and so that's why you see not applicable for a few columns and then you get to the gig workers where you are eligible and of course individual taxpayers who were previously W-2 employees but they were furloughed, let go, laid off, any of those kind of categories, um, you also can tap into state unemployment. So the way it works is um, state unemployment is, is a state program. It's not typically a federal program. So, but the federal government wanted a way to help um, those who were inevitably going on to unemployment as a result of federal, state, and local governments shutting down so quickly. So we know it's nobody's fault. Um, it's COVID-19's fault, if anything. Um, and so they, um, the government wanted a, a safety net for these types of employees to get them through until we're able to reopen. So um, the pandemic unemployment, the way it worked is um, that when you hear pandemic unemployment, that's your clue that that's the federal portion of the program. And what Congress did was um, it, it is now synthesizing with every state unemployment's office in very quick time to say that, look, we know you have your own state unemployment system and the amount of money that you're willing, the minimum that you give, the maximum that you give for how many weeks that you give we want to regulate that and uniform it so that during this pandemic period um, it it lasts for up to 39 weeks um, it can um, because a lot of states only have maybe 13 week unemployment programs we want to um, increase the base um, so that whatever your whatever a w-2 employee who's been furloughed needs as pandemic, um, needs as unemployment, whatever they qualify at your state level, we want to add $600 per week to that program to get them through up to July 31st. Um, and that's when that program will sunset. So if you haven't applied yet and you think you might be eligible, you should do it. Um, and for those who are 1099 workers, um, or self-employed people in that um, right-hand column next to the end, um, what happens here is a lot of states couldn't get up and running right away to be able to have you complete your form so it was staggered throughout the country. Um, and I'm not sure exactly when Utah's went online. It was probably in April where a lot of other Western states did. Um, and so the key here is um, all because you were you were forced to wait to apply for your unemployment. Um, let's say it was April 28th. I'm just throwing out a date. That doesn't mean your effective date of being eligible for benefits is April 28th. 
you actually are eligible retroactively. And what I have found in the office hours that I do on Zoom, on, and I've been doing them for the last two and a half months, a lot of people have figured out that you know they can get on unemployment, but they are not asking for that retroactive amount. And you are not only eligible for it, you should do it because there's a lot of money that you're leaving on the table if you don't do it. Um, and so the way it would work for 1099 workers is you would apply still through your state unemployment office and you will likely be, and actually it's a good thing, if you are rejected in that first round because they're using their old structure for unemployment in that first round. And you're gonna be rejected because typically a self-employed person is not eligible for state unemployment compensation. So what will happen is it will be followed up with an invitation for you to apply for pandemic unemployment. And that's where the golden ticket is because at that point, you will upload your Schedule C um, of your 1040 tax return and that will help to qualify you um, uh, as a business and you will um, have to answer a few questions that you were economically impacted by COVID-19 like the rest of the world. Um, and not only will that give you the $600 that the federal government is giving for um, extra pandemic unemployment, but they are also going to fund the Maryland, I mean Maryland, the Utah um, portion of state unemployment, probably some minimum amount um, so that you will receive you know, um, somewhere, I mean, some states you can get $1,100 a week. Some states it's $700 a week. It depends on your state's minimum level of unemployment basis per week. Once you get qualified for pandemic unemployment, please, like I mentioned, go after that retroactive amount. It depends on when your state actually closed down and that will determine the official date. Most of them are sometime in the second half of March. And um, in order to make sure you're doing it correctly, you need to certify each, week's of, each week of unemployment and answer those same questions. Did you look for work? Were you available for work? Those kinds of things in order to um, qualify. Remember to think like with your business hat on and not as an employee. So if they say, did you work? Let's say you're a photographer, you might be still doing things, but if you're not earning money for that, it's not work. So that's a typical um, problem that a lot of self-employed artists have been falling into and that they're truthfully answering a question. Yes, I worked, I did a painting, I did this, but you weren't commissioned for that. No one's paying you to do that and you didn't receive payment for that. Another um, trap that artists get um, caught in is that you may receive belated payment for work that you did in January, but you're receiving it in April. And when the question comes up, did you get paid? Did you earn money this week? Your answer should be no, because you earned that money in January. You just received payment in April. These are the two most common mistakes that, are hap that happen that kind of clog up your unemployment process. So let's move to a few other items that these I'll go a little bit more quickly on. The one thing I just want to mention about unemployment is uh, reinforce the fact that it will sunset on July 31st. State unemployment will not sunset, but every state has a limit on how long an individual can stay on unemployment. Um, and then they'll kick you off those rolls and probably move you on to some kind of a more of a welfare program, um, but um, the pandemic portion, which is what is the healthy funded amount, is only through July 31st. And I can also say from a legislative point of view, from a political point of view, um, there is no appetite in Congress um, or the White House to extend these benefits beyond July 31st um, because there have been enough cases where people are actually making more money on pandemic unemployment than on say their retail job that they were working or their waiter or waitress job that they were making. So, um, and then there have been some kind of scams that have been created, but there that's not what's causing the problem. The biggest problem is that um, they feel like it's been too generous of a program. And also because so many um, 
governments have started reopening, um, it's harder to qualify for unemployment um, for that reason. Okay, um, I'm going to skip over a few of these others about um, sick leave. Um, just to the only thing I'm going to say about it is that employers with 50 or more um, are now required to extend the amount of days that they need to provide as unemployment, and it's a minimum of 80 hours, and that's specifically because of this COVID period. Let's move on to the next thing. For those of you who are students, your federal loans were automatically um, put in forbearance until September 30th. So um, you may notice that you're not getting um, automatic withdrawals for pay your monthly payments on your student loans that were federal loans um, because of that. And if you are, you can request that they be um, given forbearance. Let's keep moving. And this one is an interesting one. Um, so when it comes to FICA, which is the Social Security and combination Social Security tax and Medicaid, um, which is about 6.2%, the way it works is um, an employer, um, an employee pays out of their own gross pay 6.2% to pay for their Social Security future retirement. But the employer, if you're a W-2 employee, your employer will match that with their 6.2% contribution. What the CARES Act did was it is allowing employers to defer payment on their portion of the 6.2% payroll tax to 50% that can be paid in 2021 and the remaining balance of 50% to be paid in 2022. This is, um, it doesn't, um, mean that they are allowed to never pay it. It just means it's a cash management issue where they can just delay making those payments because after all, this is going towards your retirement account as an employee. But just know that your employer has that right. For gig artists, this becomes important because um, self-employed people have to pay both the employee and employer portion. So you can um, defer payments on your employee your portion of your FICA during this period. We can move on. Now we get to the juicy section. Paycheck Protection Program. Um, I think quite a few have of you have been able to secure this program. You can see it's eligible to all forms of businesses um, that um, have 500 or fewer W-2 employees. You're not allowed to count your 1099 employees in this loan program. So what it is, is it's a program that runs through the Treasury Department and SBA, but um, it is administered by commercial banks and financial institutions across the country. So in order to apply for it, you go through a bank and you do not go directly through the government to make your loan application. Um, now, a lot has changed ever since this originally initiated, um, and it's an extremely popular program to the point that it had to be replenished um, two week because the first round of funding, which um, is in the billions, um, the first round was $350 billion, um, and then they added another $300 billion because it ran out of money so fast because it was such a popular program. The reason why it's popular is because this is one of the few loans that can be forgivable, which means it's an out-and-out -out grant that you can convert it to. Another aspect of it that makes it so wonderful is that that forgivable grant, if it does get forgiven and turned into just a grant to you, um, it is not taxable income. The IRS and Treasury Department have confirmed that through regulations that it's not taxable income to you. This is most helpful for the for-profit and um, self-employed individual, not so much for the nonprofit because you're not paying taxes anyways on your income. Um, so how does it work? Um, this is a program where you can capture um, all, and the purpose of it is to keep your, your employees employed and off of unemployment. So 
keep that in mind when I explain this program. So um, what you do is you take 12 months of your payroll expenses, which can include health insurance and um, retirement benefit contributions that you make for employees and things like that, sick pay, and their gross pay. And you add that up for the previous 12 months and you have a choice of making it calendar year 2019 or what's called the trailing 12 months before you apply. Trailing 12 months mean the immediate past, um, the immediate previous 12 months to the date you apply. So if you apply in June, it would be May 2020 through, let me see if I can do my math, uh, June of 2019, if that adds up to 12 months. So uh, it, it's up to you because you might have a higher payroll amount or more number of employees, whatever the number is, you've got to work out which one is to your benefit and the way you figure out which one is to your benefit is not just how much money you can get, but also how much money can you be forgiven so you turn that loan into a grant and you don't have anything left over so that you have to carry as debt. Um, and that plays an important role. So first, the amount. So we look at that 12 months and what the government says is you divide that by 12 to figure out what your monthly payroll is, including all those health benefit things. And then once you divide by 12, that's your monthly amount. And then to figure out what your um, possible loan amount is, you multiply that by 2.5. So let's say your number ends up being um, $25,000 as your loan amount. Um, that is what you would do to apply for a loan through a bank. And since this program um, got announced, um, banks had to get approved to be an administrator for the program. So you had a lot of the big banks, but the, the real heroes in this entire program have been small community banks and credit unions because they've been willing to administer the small nonprofit loans and the gig um, workers loans and self-employed work workers loans because the way banks make money off this as being the administrators is they get a percentage of the loan amount. So they have an incentive to approve and fast track the giant multi-million dollar loan requests as opposed to the $25,000 loan requests. So, um, so the community banks have been the real heroes. I feel that they've been doing the best job. So if you haven't applied yet, you need to get going and I would focus on some of these community banks. But since then, some online financial institutions have also been approved to process these. And that includes PayPal, Square, Cabbage, places like that where you can go completely online. I have to tell you, you have zero customer service, but it processes it fairly quickly. And that becomes important because the Paycheck Protection Program while it still has over $100 billion left, um, and it's likely not going to be able to use all of the money that it was given. Um, so there's not a rush anymore in terms of first come, first serve. The rush now is that the program is going to expire on June 30th. And the last opportunity um, to get a loan is it has to be approved, not applied for, but approved by June 30th, which means you need to give your bank at least one week to process the application. So my recommendation to everyone listening, and please tell your friends and families that this might apply to, get going, try to put your application in this week and at the latest Monday of next week to process a loan application through a community bank. Um, and, you know, do the application and if you accept it, if you choose not to accept it, if there are any other kind of things that you're thinking about might not, give yourself the option of deciding that by applying and then making the decision afterwards whether you accept it or not. Um, and I'll go through what some of those possibilities of why you may or may not want to accept it. Um, but you won't have that choice unless you apply and get approved for the loan. So that's the key. The, the next part is the, the strain and harassment and anxiety that it has caused people on 
how to get forgiveness for the loan because the first application form that came out was horrendous with lots of calculations and um, places that you could fall between the cracks and it was overwhelming to a lot of groups. The good news that I mentioned at the top of the hour that there's breaking news about is that the Treasury Department just released today, one hour ago, the final um, forgiveness application form that replaces the one that was released on May 15th with this brand new form and it's actually two forms. They've created an easy form, which is really applicable to self-employed um, individuals and other types of applications that are fairly easy, where there are really no um, no calculate, me, no calculations of any considerable means that you have to apply to. If we could take a moment to share the screen with this other um, document, it'll take a moment for Morgan to get that up. Um, and I'll explain while she's doing that. This is also can be found on our website. And it'll take you to the brand new press release that just came down. If you could scroll down, Morgan, a little bit, you'll see, let's pause there. Let's go up a little bit more, go up a little bit more. There we go. That's great. So you can see that um, the SBA got an earful from Congress and from borrowers that their original application form was too complicated. So they really listened and they, and the other thing that you should know is Congress has told the Treasury Department that they expect um, the SBA and Treasury to lean towards trying to get these things fully forgiven and not be sticklers to, you know, nickel and dime people on how much um, is not forgiven. So uh, they made it a lot easier and they're now introducing an easy version um, form and they're really set up for people who are self-employed with no employees or they didn't see any reduction in salary or wages or in headcount. These are two areas that are more applicable to, multi, uh, to employers with multi W-2 employees. Um, so if Morgan, you could click on the view easy forgiveness application form um, so that people get a sense of what this looks like. So let's just scroll down. It's, it's quite easy and you're going to just list your payroll costs here and payroll costs and let's pause there and payroll costs are again um, how much you paid yourself or your W-2 employees, what the total amount was. Um, it can include the health insurance and retirement benefits. Maximum for an employee is $100,000, um, nothing above that. For those of you who are self-employed, um, an important thing here is you cannot give yourself a raise. Um, so whatever numbers you gave as your um, Schedule C net income, that's the amount that you gotta stick with and you can't give yourself a raise. That is one of the key sticklers here. Um, and then you have to put in how much you paid for any interest on mortgage that's business related, not your personal mortgage, unless you take a portion of that as a business expense, how much you pay in rent and lease payments, and then your utility payments. Um, it's quite easy, it's a total amount. You'll always wanna have backup of evidence to prove how you got to your numbers if requested, because your banks may request that. And then you compare it to your loan amount and whatever the difference is, that's how much you still owe. And if, you, and if it's even, you don't owe any of it. Um, what else is nice is, um, what else you should know, not necessarily nice, is if you also got an idle advance, and we're going to get to that in a moment, <clears throat> it will reduce the amount that's forgivable because the, the idle advance is the first forgiveness amount against a PPP loan. So if you got $25,000 PPP loan, and a $1,000 idle advance. The maximum that you will be um, forgiven for is the first thousand on idle and then an additional 24,000. So you end up with 1,000 left over. That is debt that you can either keep or and turn it into a loan. And the interest rate is really phenomenal, 1% interest rate on a PPP loan. 
And with the Flexibility Act that got passed on June 5th, you can request your lender to convert that to a five-year maturity date instead of a two-year maturity date. And you don't have to start making monthly payments on whatever's left over of that PPP loan that becomes debt until at least six months from the date on which you submitted your forgive it, forgiveness application. It's phenomenal terms, really phenomenal terms. The other choice is you don't want any debt and you just give the money back and you don't have to pay anything. Um, okay, let's go back to the CARES Act table. Okay, um, there is a lot more to go over with paycheck protection. Um, and um, I usually do webinars that last an hour and a half just on paycheck protection. So I've given you kind of an overview. I encourage you to do a few things. One is if you need more details, um, one, um, you can come to my um, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. I have office hours on Zoom that you can pop into, listen to how I um, take other people through their particular issues. You'll find that there's an overlap with questions that you have. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, and you can find the coordinates for that Zoom on artsactionfund.org front slash office hours Nina, and Morgan's going to show you where that is. Um, you can also download this CARES Act table that will take you through lots of information on the PPP program and the Flexibility Act that changed. Um, one of the key things I want to talk about the Flexibility Act that is related to the PPP loan is that on June 5th, Congress also changed two other important things in addition to the maturity um, term from two years to five years for any leftover that becomes debt. And that is uh, you, um, you can extend your covered period from eight weeks to 24 weeks. That's most helpful for like theaters and restaurants that haven't been able to open up and meet and be able to rehire their employees, which is a requirement for getting forgiveness on the PPP loan. And then a second um, feature that has proven to be very helpful for that same group is that um, you the formula for how much you use on payroll compared to overhead has changed from 75%, 25%, meaning 75% on payroll, 25% on overhead. And now that's changed to a formula of 60, 40, where it's a minimum, and that please under, uh, understand that I'm underscoring this point. You need to spend a minimum of 60% of your loan on payroll HR um, costs and a maximum of 40% on those limited um, overhead costs that I mentioned um, and that are in the application form. So what does that mean? You can spend 100% on payroll if you want. The only um, catch is that if you are a self-employed person or you are the owner of your company that got the PPP, you cannot give yourself a raise. You cannot increase people's salary below, be beyond 100000 to make that 100%. So your loan was for two and a half times your monthly pay based on the previous 12 months. So that implies that you, as an individual owner or, um, Ella or a self-employed person, it's impossible for you to use 100% on payroll because uh, if you had multiplied your loan, um, uh, your monthly amount by two, that's 100% of your payroll, but you got two and a half times your payroll. So you need to use that percentage for overhead costs. Okay, let's go back to the CARES Act table. Thank you, Morgan. Let's scroll down. This is the other next popular program, and this is called EIDL, E-I-D-L, which stands for Emergency Injury Disaster Loan Program. This is administered directly by the SBA. You have to apply for it at sba.gov. And there are two components of it. 
It's also available to nonprofits, commercial um, for-profit arts companies, and to self-employed gig workers. Um, so the key here is that there's an advanced portion and an actual loan portion. Um, if you, and up for the last three weeks, it's been closed to non-agricultural companies that if you've applied, you haven't been able to get through. This week, they just reopened it because they processed all the agricultural applications and they're back to opening it up to all businesses and gig workers. So this is a key time to apply again because these monies are not without a limit either. So you apply for a very simple form, sba.gov, um, on a very simple form and you are eligible for an advance. And what the advance is, it will pay up to $10,000 based on $1,000 per employee. You can only count W-2 employees. For those of you who are self-employed, even though you are not a W-2 employee, you need to count yourself as an employee. A lot of people have made mistakes and not counted themselves as employees and you've missed out on getting a thousand dollars grant advance right up front from idle so that's an important piece so um you make your uh, you make your, on this one form you make um a request to the sba for an idle and once you make it on that one form it gets split up into two division two divisions one part of sba is going to process the advance to see if you're eligible and if you put in all the right information about your back, your business's background and qualifications, and you wrote down the number of W-2 employees you have, whether they're full-time or part-time, doesn't matter, you'll get $1,000 per employee. Um, that you do not have to repay. It's out and out grant. It gets unceremoniously deposited into your checking account as a federal deposit, and that's the way that works. But within a short amount of time after that, you are going to get a separate email from SBA, and this is all done by online um, web email, and they are going to offer you a loan. Um, please don't get it confused with a PPP loan. This is directly from SBA.gov. This is not a forgivable loan, and there is no chance in the future of it being forgiven. Um, so you need to take this one with your eyes wide open. You're probably going to be offered quite a bit of money. Um, and here are some things that you need to know. If you're a nonprofit, the interest rate is 2.75%. If you are for profit or a gig worker self employed, the interest rate is 3.75%. Um, the long term in maturity is 30 years. That's unbelievable. That's like a mortgage. So it's it's going to be very easy to pay off. The next thing is that you don't even have to begin making monthly payments until a year later. So for those of you who have been using their credit cards to get through the last couple of months and they've racked up, you're paying probably 16 to 21% interest rate on those. Even if you got them deferred payment, you're going to have to pay that interest rate at minimum. If you get offered that SBA loan and you want to take it on, take it and pay off those credit cards so that you're not paying huge interest rates and you're paying instead low interest rates and you're not even having to make an, a payment for a year from now. Um, but just remember that's debt that you are putting on the books and you will eventually have to repay it. But for instance, I helped someone with a um, idle loan just recently and I'm going to give you a sense of how cheap it is. So they are in the 3.75% category of interest rate. They got a $17,500 SBA loan. And a year from now, they'll have to pay only $86 a month for the next 30 years um, to pay off that loan, which seemed really reasonable. There is no penalty for prepaying the loan. And the one last thing I want you to know about it is that if you borrow $25,000 or less, you don't even need any collateral. Um, you don't have to put up any collateral to secure that loan. So it's quite easy. Um, I think I'm going to stop there because there's more content that I could possibly contain in just this short amount of time. So I wanna leave just a little room for questions and see it, what else is on people's minds. So Vicki, I'm gonna hand it back to you. 
Um, thanks, Nina. So there was a question about um, the PPP funding. Is it possible to extend PPP funding now that we have a larger window yes. by working 10 hours a week and collecting partial unemployment? Okay, so I have to take back, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just because of that last clause you said. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, you cannot, remember what I said with PPP, the purpose of PPP is to keep your employees off of unemployment. So you cannot double dip. You cannot collect um, unemployment and um, receive PPP money during the same covered period. Now I'm going to give you an exception, a loophole, however you want to call it. Um, if you can manage to stay within the eight weeks of the original PPP, I what I'm suggesting to people is if you think your unemployment is going to give you more money or better money or something like that, um, and but you already have the PPP loan, finish it off in the eight weeks and then up, get start your unemployment the day after your um, PPP loan coverage period ends. So some people got their PPP loan in early April even. Um, and so they're looking at concluding their 56 days or eight weeks um, any day now. And so for them, and this is primarily, I'm talking to those who are the self-employed 1099 people, because you're the only ones who are eligible for both. What I'm telling um, folks is finish that paperwork for the forgiveness, keep your um, period to only eight weeks if you can get it 100% forgiven or close to it, and then move on to pandemic unemployment because that is gonna conclude on July 31st. So if you wanna capture a piece of that, that's the way, that's the only way you can do both, but you can't do both at the same time. Okay. Here's a, uh, I'm going to remind people if you have any questions to please put them in the Q&A section, which is on the bottom of your screen. But while we're waiting, I have a, well here, no, never mind. Here's a question. I am a self-employer owner of two LLCs, both for music industry. Could I apply for a PPP loan for each of these companies? Um, the answer is yes, but do they pay for the same thing? Are they paying for different things? Hmm. Um, do I have to have many employee, employ, employers? Employers. Yeah. Or employees. Must, oh, I think you meant employees. Okay, yeah. and I'm looking at it at the same time. So I think you meant employees. So here's the way I'm going to answer this question. Um, you don't need any employees. Um, you. It can just be you as the owner of the LLC and can apply. The big thing here is, do these two LLCs really have two different identities, two different federal ID numbers, two different checking accounts? Um, are, are, do, they, do you complete two different Schedule Cs or are you compiling both of these LLCs into your 1040, one 1040? I think these are things to be on the lookout for that might cause a problem. Theoretically, two LLCs could apply for two PPP loans, but it starts to get dicey if you are um, converging both of them into one Schedule C, I think. Uh, the second um, part of your question that wasn't read out loud, but I see it is, um, can you include oversee employees or employers, I guess? Um, and the answer is no. Um, you have to be a U.S. company and the employees have to be U.S. employees. Not U.S. citizens, but just residents in um, the U.S. Okay, we have another question. We did not receive the original EIDL $1,000 per employee. Was this a standard and expected amount for all small businesses that applied for the EIDL simplified loan that could be turned into a grant? So the, these, are two, the, these are two things that are getting um, mixed up. So the first thing on the EIDL 1000 per employee, for you to have gotten that, um, I mentioned that 
a common mistake that a lot of self-employed people were doing is they weren't counting themselves as an employee. So if you didn't do that in your original idle application, um, that's why you missed out on the thousand dollars. There, you might be able to go back to SBA and see one of two things. One, can you amend that original application so it can be reconsidered? Or two, can you um, um, just resubmit a brand new application? Um, so that's the first thing. Then the second thing seems to be confusing idle and PPP. Um, an idle loan can never be converted into a grant. Only a PPP loan can be converted into a grant. Your PPP loan has to be applied through a bank. The idle loan has to be applied by, through sba.gov. Okay. And it looks like at a prior question, he has um, uh, one LLC with an EIN and then the other LLC without an EIN. So they must be using the same EIN but number. Could this person let us know, are, are you putting both on one Schedule C? Or are they filing separate tax returns for the LLCs? Because I'm being very specific like this because that is the end all of everything because you have to submit your Schedule C and if they see the same Schedule C is used for two different companies, um, they're gonna be very suspicious. Yeah. Um, we have another question. When do you anticipate the Main Street Lending Program will be available for nonprofit 501c3s? It appears rules were proposed on Monday. Does that mean nonprofits will be included mm -hmm. only waiting for the rules? Um, very good question. So in my um, CARES Act table, I put in information on those brand new uh, Main Street Lending Programs. So um, on Monday, the rules for small businesses, the changes that they made for small businesses, the original Main Street Lending Program um, had a minimum um, loan that you had to take out of $500,000 and nothing less. That was too much for smaller businesses. So they reduced that minimum amount to $250,000 and then also made some um, eligibility requirements a little bit more flexible. When they made that announcement on Monday, they also announced that rules for creating a new, what they call facility, which is not a building. Um, it means a program in Federal Reserve words. Um, when they create a program um, for, uh, um, th they announced that they will soon be announcing a facility lending program for nonprofit 501c3 organizations. And within two days of that, let's see, that happened, on, no, it was actually the next day on Tuesday of this week, yesterday, more breaking kind of news. Um, uh, the, um, they released the regulations that they've proposed on nonprofits. And right now they are in a comment period. And the general public and small businesses and nonprofits can now submit comments of how that might be a problem, what they could fix to make it better for nonprofits and things like that. Um, Federal Reserve Chairman um, Jerome Powell has been um, on the Hill testifying for the last two days. Uh, yesterday it was in the Senate and today it was in the House Financial Services Committee. And I've been keeping it on TV. You can listen to it, I think on MSNBC, they've been showing it live. Um, and there have been a lot of questions about the nonprofit program. Um, after June 22nd, and they get their comments, shortly within that, I would say by the end of June, they will release the new nonprofit program. I personally wouldn't get too excited about it because the initial rules are not so great. Um, the, it's exact, the terms are exactly the same as the small business terms that were released on Monday, which is an interest rate of... Um, it's called LIBOR, L-I-B-O-R, and it's related to a London um, interest rate term, plus 300 points. Now, to put that in layman terms, what that means is LIBOR is currently under 1%, and 300 points is a fancy way of saying 3% interest rate. So it's just under 4% interest rate, which is right around where your idle loan is, which is remember, not forgivable. The Main Street Lending Program loan 
is not forgivable. And Chairman Powell, multiple times being asked multiple different ways, can it ever be a forgivable loan for the nonprofits? And the answer is no, it's no from the regulations. They are strictly a lending program. It would absolutely have to take an act of Congress to change it. And it would change the complete nature of the Federal Reserve in itself because they're all about a lending program for banks and now directly for um, borrowers. Um, the lending program, you still have to go through a bank to get the loan, just like a PPP. Um, the only difference also between the small business regulation facility that they came out with on Monday for lending and the nonprofit is um, they have a few more what they call easier rules to be eligible for for the nonprofit and in terms of collateral. Um, but that's about it. I think what people are really looking for is the term, which is also not great. I think it's something like seven years and the interest rate. Um, personally, I think um, the SBA idle, if you are going to take on debt, I think that's the best thing out there, especially if you're a nonprofit, because the nonprofit rate is 2.75. And this SP in this Main Street loan thing, you're looking at something closer to 4%. So Nina, can I ask you a question? There's a lot of CARES Act funding coming through the National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, our agency, Utah Humanities, West Staff. Do organizations need to be concerned um, with tracking or if they get money from more than one agency and it's all CARES dollars? So it, um, what there, there are a few times when it matters that it's coming from CARES dollars, but really what matters is how you're using the CARES money. Um, and not the fact that it originated from CARES Act. Here's where it matters that it's CARES Act money is, um, you can't, um, I mentioned earlier, you can't be on unemployment, pandemic unemployment, and be within your covered period of your paycheck protection loan. Um, that is definitely a no-no. Um, other than that, um, are there any other double dipping things? Um, probably not. Now, um, the key here is now looking at the expense side of things. You can't ask someone to pay for the same, you can't exp um, ask multiple sources to pay for the same expense, um, especially if they're paying 100% of that expense. There's a little bit of leeway if they're not paying for 100% of the expense, for sure. So I'm gonna give you an example of the NEA one. Um, so the NEA will be announcing, by the way, it's um, if any of you um, applied for a direct grant from the NEA um, because you were eligible for their special CARES Act funding, um, they're announcing their grants on June 26. The period for which you can use the funds begins July 1st. So let's go back to the Paycheck Protection Program. For those of you who say got your paycheck protection program in early April, you're going to, and then you stick to the eight week coverage period. You want, you want to complete that eight weeks and, and submit your um, forgiveness application. But the key is complete your eight weeks forgiveness um, coverage period. And let's say you were paying for the executive director of the organization's pay 100% with the paycheck protection loan program. Um, you can, you can, let's say you're, you're, um, you achieve getting an award from the National Endowment for the Arts, and that is also meant to pay for the executive director's um, salary. So um, the key here is the NEA one's coverage period doesn't even begin until July 1st. You're going to finish your paycheck protection eight week program, hopefully before July 1st. Um, and if you don't, then um, the NEA program um, has you being able to use it for a year. Um, you can say, you can use, I, 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 I don't believe that it will cover 100% of all of the salary and the other things that you have covered because every NEA grant is limited to $50,000. That's no matter what um, size organization you are, it's a $50,000 grant and that's it. So 
you could say that $50,000 grant is going to pay for the second half or the last quarter, or it's going to include not only payroll, but it's also going to include um, paying for some contracted artists. 1099 um, artists are not eligible to get um, use PPP money for, but you can use it for an NEA grant. So you got to think about that. But the key here is um, if you are asking an entity to pay 100% for something, you can't ask another entity to pay for the same thing. Okay. That's really helpful, Nina. And I, I think we've actually gone over our time with you. You've been so generous with us today. I, I, I really appreciate it and want to thank you again so much. We've put links in the chat. We've recorded this for those of you who've been um, on the call and we will post it on our website. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Nina. If you'd like to say any parting words, go for it. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we are gonna be doing a webinar now that these forgiveness loan applications have been released today. We're gonna be doing an Arts U webinar that will be free. So I encourage you to um, come and get more information where I can go into detail about that. We'll also have um, our attorney with Brownstein Hyatt um, on the call who is a specialist in this area. And then um, to stay up to date on all these late breaking news, legislation, and kind of CARES Act funding, I encourage you all to join for free, the artsactionfund.org front slash join. Join the family. Thank you so much. Again, okay. again, goodbye, everybody. We really appreciate Bye. you joining us today. Take care.